Thank you very much for this brilliant talk, which I think we are all very touched at the moment. Clemens, no? Do you want to comment on the end of the lecture or? Well, yes, I, when Paul said there is going to be an ending about Germany, uh, I thought this would be exciting, but uh, you know, I didn't, didn't anticipate it would be that exciting uh, and indeed provocative. And my understanding is that there are maybe well, let me put this differently. I, I'm not sure there is really conflict between interests and purpose here. I, I think uh, the key issue is one of timings. So, I mean, we currently have this conflict in Ukraine. And I suppose what we want, and there, there re certainly is this conflict in the short term, we would like to cut gas revenues for Russia. Uh, and there is a clear conflict uh, regarding uh, economic short-term economic interest. I think there is more to it than German interest because if we do it, it needs to be European. So you could say, okay, that's, you know, that, that's an excuse. Uh, but um, I mean, there's the Hungary situation. So it's a rather complex uh, situation. And then there's the medium term issue, which is again different. I think if we ask ourselves, what should we do in the medium term? Uh, my view is, uh, yes, we shouldn't return to the status quo, but this enthusiasm for turning Russia into North Korea worries me a little because I think, yes, even if Putin stays, we should do trade with them, but we should never again depend on them uh, in the way we did. So um, I, I think this conflict between purpose and interests is uh, maybe more a short-term one, and is it really? A conflict if you wonder about what German interests are. I mean, we don't want to be taken over by Putin, so there is this appeasement issue, and maybe in a broader sense, our interest is uh, to fight, you know, with all we can, uh, to, to fight Putin with all we can. So I'm not, not sure there is really this strong conflict. I think it is our, our enlightened interest, if you like, to work for the, uh, you know, for Ukraine and support them in the way we can. I think it's um, important to keep increasing the pressure on Putin until, um, basically, until uh, he's displaced. And um, the prudent thing to do is to keep mounting the pressure um, uh, until that happens. Um, and uh, the, what Putin is suffering from is a hemorrhage, a massive hemorrhage of the educated young people in the society. Um, and uh, in particular, um, I happen to know this for other reasons, but he's hemorrhaging um, uh, people with competence in IT. Um, and a lot of the military systems, modern military systems, depend upon a considerable competence in IT. And so he, his, his military capacity is being degraded at an astonishing speed. Um, and we just have to keep mounting that pressure so there is no ambiguity. That's why we have to, um, so the prudent thing is indeed um, to just make it absolutely clear. No, whilst he's there, whilst he's there, there's no, there's, 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 there's no future in Russia. Maybe there's this other aspect in German behavior, which is fear. So there is just a lot of fear in German society about the reactions of Putin. And there's this idea that if we deliver arms, uh, he will use weapons of mass destruction and so on. That has, you know, that is very strong in Germany. A lot of, that, I think my understanding is that's why a lot of people say, let's not, let's try to avoid deliver, delivering arms, which I believe is more important than cutting the gas, although the two are important. Uh, and and uh, there, there's just not, uh, you know, this uh, Churchillian type resolve that we are bringing this person we are stopping this person, and uh, the, my understanding is that the government, um, uh, you know, partly 
uh, takes up these fears and uh, somehow doesn't want to rock the boat by too much. Can I just respond to that and then I'll... Then I'll, I'll come back to the yeah. yeah. And this is directed to the, the Cardinal here. I'm very interested to, hear, to, to know what he thinks of this, but um, I work mainly on transitions out of from poor societies and what I tell them is there is no substitute for courage um, uh, the all these transitions are subject to radical uncertainty that is to say we don't know right? I think that the principle of providence gives us the confidence to say we can be we can afford to be brave because the warp of history is towards a providential future and we're never going to get anywhere by fear if our ancestors of 200,000 years ago had trembled at the prospect of killing a mammoth I'd have still run, on, in, run, run into one coming round the corner tonight. I'm very glad our ancestors found the very considerable courage to hunt down lions, to hunt down mammoths. If they can do that, right, we can be a little bit courageous ourselves. Good. <laughs> Let's come back to the topic of tonight, reversing polarization. One question, are there particular historic events that exemplify society's polarization in history? Um, that exemplified the move to polarization or the move from it? So the move to, um, um, this is the, the genius of uh, Robert Putnam's book, and also Michael Sandel's book, which really sees the, um, so Putnam really sees the, 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 the collapse of common purpose in America as setting in um, during, the, during my, my teenage years, the 1960s, the late 60s. Um, and, um, uh, and, and then, uh, gradually getting worse until 2000, the year 2000, at which time it falls off a cliff, which is social media. So America, massive degeneration. And Michael Sandel's book, The Tyranny of Merit, which is the critique of the, merit, the rise of meritocracy, um, we can date that very precisely. Um, the word was coined um, in the, in the mid-1950s, um, and it was coined, the word meritocracy was meant to describe a future dystopia. And now, somewhere, so 1957, meritocracy signaled a disastrous state of affairs, dystopia. In fact, the book that, you, that coined it was a prediction of an imagined society in the year 2030 when you'd have this uh, tyranny of, the, of, 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 of merit. Um, and of course it came much sooner. Um, the swing from merit, meritocracy being a negative word uh, to a positive word was from 1950s to the 1990s. By the 1990s it was already P. Interestingly, Young, Young's book you referred to, this book about meritocracy or this dystopian uh, version uh, of, of uh, meritocracy uh, includes this story about a group of the population starting to rebel against this merit, mer meritocracy and uh, they call themselves populists. So they, uh, you know, there, there we have the populists going against that and, uh, you know, I think what we see today uh, in terms of populism, I believe in Eastern Germany, but also in places like Poland, uh, is a very similar pattern. So it's people uh, dissatisfied uh, with uh, meritocratic aspects of society. I, I work quite a lot in the European Commission, and I'm 
really trying to get them to, to see that um, we have to have this common purpose of lifting up the poorest places. Um, so um, it, this can't be left right, um, to um, so, so, so Slovakia is poor, but there's some regions of Slovakia which are much poorer than others. We can't just say, oh, that's a problem for Slovakia. It's a problem for Europe. We need to have some program which lifts the poorest regions. Um, and at the moment, we're, we're sort of celebrating the successful. Um, and astonishingly, Hillary Clinton, whom I, I know, um, she's a clever, decent person, but when she lost, um, she said, oh, but I, but I didn't really lose because um, I won in seven in the, the, the regions which control 70% of the economy. Trump only won in the regions that control 30% of the economy. He won half the votes pretty well, um, but he won votes in poor places. I, the, the leading Democrat of my country, of my generation, I won the votes in the successful places. Aren't, isn't that great? How could she think that? You know, I mean, the, the parties that believe in, you know, sort of uh, the, the poorer part of the population should be, should be anxious for the interests of the poorer part of the population. I, I'm very proud of, I work a lot with Colombia and um, uh, the, the, the candidate for the center right has just come out with an article in the Financial Times um, which uh, is almost verbatim the future of capitalism and it says um, if we are it, the mistake we have made in Latin America has been that the successful people haven't given sufficient priority to the, un, to the unsuccessful and with a polarized society, it has to be the successful that move first. The successful have to make the first sacrifice. Of course, we've got to come together and say that the people who, the poorer people, have to accept that we're in one society, not in two different opposing camps, but they won't come together unless we make the first move. And in Europe, Unfortunately, it's back to the story that Germany is the richest country. Um, and so, again, um, enlightened self-interest, yes. Because if, if Europe falls apart, Germany will lose a lot. But it's enlightened self-interest, which is the concept I used in the bottom billion. Enlightened self-interest, not short-term self-interest. So you've got to think long-term. I agree to that. but. I think, you know, to understand polarization, there's more to it than that. Uh, so let me tell you a story Angela Merkel told uh, two years ago at a meeting of the Conservative Party. They were discussing the rise of the AFD in Germany, okay, so the right-wing populists, and, uh, you know, what do these guys think and why are they what they are? And she said, look, uh, I mean, when she was young, she was a physicist in the GDR, right? Uh, so this was a closed society, and uh, they, they, had their, they had good physicists, but uh, their equipment in the lab was shitty because they didn't have the computers uh, and so on. And she said, I had a lot of colleagues who said, if we had the labs they have in the West, we would all be big stars, and they would be no good. And then German reunification came. They did get the equipment the people in the West had, and many of these guys were totally unsuccessful. They were not successful. And she said, these are the people voting AFD today. So what does that mean? They came from a dictatorship and a society with hierarchical structure, structures, which wasn't meritocratic at all, to a society that was meritocratic, you know, with competition, with possibilities, but a society where if you were unsuccessful, you had nobody to blame but yourself. And they, they bought AFD. So it's, you know, I think this is a, another and relevant story. You know, they are poor, but they are frustrated. 
because they are not successful. And uh, my understanding is that in many regions uh, in Eastern Germany, but also in places like Poland or Hungary, if we want to understand populist movements today, why are they so dominating? Why do they have major win majorities? I think part is exactly what you say. You know, there are poor regions and regions left behind, but it's not everything. It's also the, simply the frustration uh, of people who experience that in a meritocratic open society, uh, they may not be successful. And they, then they start looking for other ways, uh, you know, through the political system uh, of being successful, making careers. It's, I think it's something we shouldn't forget. Uh, and it's maybe harder to address than uh, the traditional ideas of doing, doing more for uh, regions left behind and so on. It's also an issue of disdain, isn't it? That the, um, in a way, um, the, the concept of the Aussie um, uh, was created after unification, not before it. And that was, um, uh, and, and I, th I think uh, Cole's enormous achievement was, was managing to, 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 to persuade uh, Germans to make the huge sacrifice to make reunification work. Um, but but it's hard, you know, you've devoted um, uh, a huge, you know, something like 10% of German GDP to reunification for a long time. Um, and it's still unfinished business for the reasons you say. I mean, um, I've got a whole team that's working on East Germany because it's so many useful lessons for elsewhere in the world. And some cities like Leipzig have actually managed to you know, devolved leadership has worked, and there are other places where it's a complete failure. Um, now, what ought to happen is the successful places should be in a network where the, where the, the unsuccessful places learn. Um, um, but, but East Germany was such a highly centralized, top-down place that it's hard to rebuild community. What that tells you is that it's just going to take a lot of money and a long time. And in the meantime, um, you must maintain the sense that it is our duty to do this. And that that is then written out on a larger scale um, across Europe. And it's, it's going to be a big task. It's not um, uh, give a bit of money to Italy and scrutinize it and actually, you know, or tell, tell Greeks they're all crooks. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a very big common purpose which will take a, a generation of sacrifice, but it'll be worth it because only that way will we secure Europe, I think. Put it more abstract. So for you, very important is building communities local communities, which we have to do more and more. And then we need a bigger structure to put the communities together, right? And that's the solution against polarization, right? Yep. And how we can find this common purpose. Yeah, and quite what the purposes will be will vary. As I say, in Britain, there's one common purpose, which is the equalizing intergenerational opportunities. Um, um, uh, across Europe, the common purpose really needs to be um, facing down Putin. Um, uh, so, and that that will require sacrifice. And it might be it might be a quick it might be a quick win. Putin might be toppled in the next few months, or it might take a long time. If we try to get more communities, how much? How is the relation between market and community? So. Um, the uh, maybe maybe can we can stick to the case of Europe for a moment because I think that's a very important case and a very good example and I, I think that Europe is is again maybe indeed at a pivotal moment regarding this question so are we able to build what you call common purpose if we think about the future and the challenges before us uh, I, I think it's pretty clear thinking about defense for instance now we re rely on the Americans maybe also on the Brits to defend us and, and to face Putin. 
it's not really the Europeans, the other Europeans. It's, it's the British, maybe a little the French, and the Americans who have the power and the ability to do something. Uh, we all know maybe in two years uh, there will be another president. It's unlikely, I would say, that the Democrats will win. Nobody knows, but uh, we are likely to have a less friendly president, less Europe-friendly president uh, in, in Europe. So we need to do something. I, I suppose one common purpose could be, okay, let's do something to be able to defend ourselves. Uh, are we really able to do that? I don't know. I doubt it. If you think about the Germans, our first reaction was, okay, let's uh, you know, come up with a heap of, of money and buy these F-35 fighter planes. Nobody thought about talking to the French or to the Italians. We just did it. Okay, it had to be quick. The other issue is if we think about energy policy, everybody understands that there can be no na successful national energy policy anymore. I mean, we've been doing it for a long time with our you know, focus away from nuclear, and the French have their policies and so on, but it just doesn't work because we need pipelines going from one country to another. We need to work together, and this, the sacrifice isn't even very large, so we need to sacrifice our own views, ideologies, prejudices, and uh, sovereignty in some way, or what we you know, the once thought to be sovereignty. We don't really have sovereignty in the military or in energy policy as we see now. Uh, and, but will we be able to act jointly? I don't know. And so why is this so difficult? I guess because it's not a group of 120 people, it's countries. So can I, uh, maybe also a question to you, Paul. Can, so you've explained that groups of people can find common purposes, but can groups of countries find common purposes? Is, is that possible? We did. Europe, in coming out of 1945, you know, our, our grandparents' generation built a... a, a, a a West with magnificent institutions, uh, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the United Nations, NATO. These were formidable achievements. Now, are they ideal institutions for all time? Of course not. The world has changed. The problems have changed, right? But that generation built the world um, which, uh, which we have inherited. Um, um, two years ago was the, 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 the 75th anniversary of the, the founding of uh, all this stuff. And as I was brought to, to, uh, to Paris to celebrate this. Um, and, um, uh, I, um, uh, and I reminded the French French Minister of Finance was just sitting in the audience, and Monsieur Camdesou and all the rest of it. I reminded them of the first loan that the World Bank ever made. It was made in 1947. Um, the modern equivalent of um, uh, 2.8 billion dollars, billion euro, 2.8 billion euro, and it was done with a one-page agreement um, between the the French Minister of Finance and the President of the World Bank, 2.8 billion. And I said, in 1947, France was a fragile state. And people looked a bit shocked, but then they thought back, of course in 1947, France was a fragile state. At any time, it could have collapsed into communism, right? In 1947, people realized, the whole international community of the West realized it is existentially essential that France survive as a member of the West. And so we will do whatever it takes. We will give, give them a loan of 2.8 billion. Will it be paid back? Well, here's the risk. If France falls apart, it won't be paid back. If France falls apart, the fact that we've lost 2.8 billion is the least of our worries, right? And so it is with you now, right? That if the West comes together and stands up to Putin, change problems, right? It's not the old institutions. We need to rethink these institutions, redesign them, but 
our grandparents came together and it's thanks to them doing that that we are here that's maybe that's a kind of community but as an economist maybe you would also say that's just selfish behavior uh, you know the theory of the private provision of public good ba goods basically would basically say okay if you have a big actor if you, this will happen if you have one big actor whose self-interest is strong enough to say, okay, you know, we will rescue the French because the, the benefit we have from, from rescuing the French is large enough, so we just do it. And we don't care that, you know, the British and some others benefit. Uh, so from, from that perspective, you would say the future of Europe isn't great because we don't have the Americans. I mean, in those days, it was the Americans. They said, you know, we will order the world. We are the, uh, you know, dominant player and we want this to happen. We don't need a community. We just do it. And, and in, in Europe, I mean, maybe, you know, that just proves we need, we need a sense of common purpose more than the West needed in those days, because we don't have a United States of America uh, that will make sure and makes, you know, Europe works and does what's necessary. Uh, and obviously that's the old dilemma that a country like uh, Germany or France is, too small to play that role, right? We don't have this dominant power in Europe, so maybe we have to join forces. Your grandparents, our grandparents built all those institutions. Our parents built the European community, right? Um, and so we've kept doing these coming together for purposes that are, that are larger than me now. Um, if we cannot move from me now, we will we will just deserve our fate. Thank you.